Hi, Jamie, Lola, Tallula. This is a video response to your vlog. I wrote it down because I'm kind of scatterbrained tonight. Your vlog number 29 from almost a week ago, um, April 18th. Sadly, this is not a poetry response. I am just having some poetry blocks, but you gave me an idea, so hopefully I can come up with something. And that's in one of my long, that's in tonight's long rambling vlog. But, you know, I, I feel kind of awkward doing this video response because, you know, I'm sometimes I, 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 I watch a, someone's vlog and I really, really identify with what they're saying or you know, s s sympathize with it. Um, and really want to say something back, directly addressing that, and not just, you know, in a general vlog. But I'm also not sure whether, you know, the person <laughs> really wants this, you know, conversation. So I guess, in all honesty, I like you very much. I love watching your vlogs. And, you know, if we were friends in day-to-day -day life, this is the kind of thing I might say to you over the phone. And the thing is, over the phone, you could say, shut up, Alice, I don't feel like talking about it. But I guess in YouTube, it's just as good because you can just click my button and send me away. So anyhow, um, yeah, you just seemed so down and so frustrated. And it made me realize that in a way, I'm kind of grateful that I am. my passions lie outside of my job. Um, I want to do well at what I do, don't get me wrong, but I have the kind of job that I do to get a paycheck because everyone needs a job. And I deal with, you know, the same crap that Kelly talks about, you know, pettiness between co-workers and, eh, you know, all the typical stuff when you put a group of people together that can't get away from each other. Sometimes I think co-workers are a lot like families in that, especially in a recession, you all need to be there and you all know you're not going anywhere. But for me, the criticism, if I get criticism about what I'm doing or lack of response, it's not the same thing. It is just something completely different. If somebody says, you know, I think you should have covered X, Y, and Z in your analysis, there's no emotion involved. I mean, you know, it's an analysis of an IT process. So then there's a discussion that ensues, you know, about whether it's worthwhile or not, and sometimes different people are brought in, blah, blah, blah. But what I do is not going to set the world on fire. I never, I never took the kind of job where I'm trying to change the world through what I do. And I can imagine the tremendous frustration you must be feeling because I have done volunteer work and, oh, long, long, long time ago, um, I did actually something that made me think I wanted to be a teacher, which was I was a literacy volunteer. And I taught people, um, primarily people who had English as a second language, um, I helped them learn to read. And um, I was very busy back then, and you know, I didn't do it for any length of time. But naturally, people who are going to request help from a literacy volunteer really, really want to learn to read. So I found teaching to be a marvelous experience. And I kept thinking, you know, as I would do my, what I considered my dry and dull IT job, oh, I wish I had been a teacher. But, you know, <laughs> then I, my sister had children. I became an auntie. My nieces went to school. And I saw it from this the perspective of Wow, what it takes as an adult, and I'm a helper adult, I'm not even the primary adult, my sister and brother-in-law are the primary adults, what it takes from a family to get a kid to succeed in school. And I sympathize with you completely because I have noticed some, some changes. You know, I am 50, and back in the day when I was in school, we had a smaller percentage of single parents. Um, you know, working, full-time working single parents. And um, even then we had goof-off kids. And when I think about the effort 
that my father had to put into me to keep me up to the level he thought I should be in math um, and the level that my sister, brother-in-law, and I are all pouring into my youngest niece, Ducky. I wonder if they, without that kind of support, how are teachers expected to do your job? And you know what I think? I think you're taking on more than anybody can possibly do because, yeah, you want to make, teach these kids how to think. But you know what? Teenagers don't necessarily want to be taught. And a teacher alone can only do so much unless there is a support system behind that student. And I think, you know, I think that it, it's tough because it's really hit or miss. There are a lot of parents, whether it's through just dire necessity, they just don't have the time and the energy to help their children, or whether it's just through indifference, who sort of assign all the children, all the responsibility for everything to the teacher. And that must be, if that's what you're contending with, no wonder you feel the way you do. Um, my youngest niece, Ducky, refuses to do homework, and one of her teachers, a very enthusiastic woman, um, volunteered to call her every evening and remind her to do it. And she called once, and my sister and brother-in-law were furious with Ducky that she had pushed her teacher to this point that she had to take her off time to try and encourage Duck. So, of course, um, they politely told the teacher it was no longer necessary, and they intervened in a very stringent way, and Ducky is now doing homework. And it can be a horrible, horrible battle. But they, it, it's not one teacher alone. It's your family that has to push, the, they, the, the student has to have some support from the outside. Um, and I'm a perfect case in point. I was always very good at school, you know, the nerdy one that always liked doing the book reports because I loved reading the book and blah, blah, blah. But I was not as strong in math as I was in everything else. And you could not convince me in high school. There was no math teacher that could tell me, learn this skill anyway because, you know, you might want to study something in college and then you don't want to have to take all these back courses to catch up. I would have looked at them and said, no, I don't want to. And basically, my father and I sat down at the kitchen table. He was a physicist, and he was not going to accept that I wasn't going to learn math. And we sat there every night, and we did my homework. And that was all there is to it. And I had to do it, and I had to get good grades. And a math teacher alone, no, there was no math teacher in my high school that could have made me successful without my father sitting there and telling me, you will do it. This is going to happen. And I, tr I have so much uh, admiration for him for that because I used to feel like crying when I would go to the kitchen table. And I know from the look on his face, he wanted to cry too. It was not a picnic for him. And I think more and more teachers now are facing the the challenge of being the only person in that student's life who has any interest in educating that student and that is impossible because you do have you know some exceptional teenagers of which I was not one who truly take want to take subjects that they're maybe it's not their best subject maybe it's not the one they consider the most fun but they're diligent and they want to do it anyway I mean my oldest niece has that kind of motivation Clearly, my youngest niece and I did not. Well, I didn't, and she currently doesn't. And I don't know what to tell you. Um, it is a crappy situation to be in. And I think what you're doing in pulling away is the exact right thing. Um, you seemed so down, and I just want to tell you that, the, I mean, there is a reason why you're down. Um, seeing it now, you know, from the perspective of, of an adult, perspective of, of an adult, and from watching my nieces and really seeing the difference between the support system that some families give to their children and the complete and total lack of it that other people give. I have friends who their attitude is, well, I send my kid to school. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know why he or she is not getting better grades. 
And that's as far as it goes. I mean, they, they put them on the bus in the morning and then they sit back and wonder, why won't they do their homework? What's going on? So yeah, you have a really tough situation and to make it even harder, it's a situation that everybody really does care about. Except, of course, <laughs> the parents who dump their kids on you. So, um, if you're feeling like crap, you have the kind of job that really could generate crappy feelings. And I think teachers, like psychiatrists and doctors, and you have to pull back to a certain level. I mean, think about people who work in hospice care. They would be, they work for about a year and then they would probably be, probably be unfit to ever work again if they did not allow some kind of detachment, if they didn't force some kind of detachment. And I think what you are doing, uh, what you expressed so wonderfully in your poem is, yeah, you have to. You cannot be responsible for making all these children think. All you can do, and it's going to feel very thankless, is do your best to teach them. Know that you have put out there the best that you can put out and then stop. Because I'm not even anywhere close to your situation, but I have my nieces. And I will tell my, you know, 13 and 14 year old nieces, precious pearls of wisdom from an ex-teenager, a former teenager, that I learned the hard way, that I can tell them to make their lives so much better. And they look at me with these blank faces. I mean, I, I would swear that they have gone deaf. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Can we play on the Wii now? It's like, ugh. Oh. But you know, I just have to take it on faith that when I was younger, when people were telling me things, I probably had the same idiotic expression on my face. And yet, in the crucial moments, I sometimes, I actually did sometimes remember, and it stuck with me years later, but there seems to be some trait that just kicks in when you reach that high school age or middle school age, where your face just stays blank and you just refuse to acknowledge the pearls of wisdom that people are giving you. You are really behaving like little swine when those pearls of wisdom are being given to you. So, um, I, just, I just tell them in the hopes that it really is sticking in some part of their brain and that when they encounter a situation or sometime maybe when they're not conf you know, in front with me, in front of me, that, you know, they'll give it some consideration. Um, Dale Kwan gave some great advice about shoes. Um, everybody, I mean, I, I went through a phase where I squeezed my feet into uncomfortable shoes. And I went limping out of a few clubs back in my day, too. And, you know, I will tell my nieces the same great advice, and they will go limping out of clubs. But, with any luck, the first time they go limping around after having picked completely inappropriate shoes, maybe something I say will ring a bell on the back of their minds, and maybe they won't do it again. You never know. But I, I know it sounds like I'm digressing. It's just that what you do is so valuable, and I think, I think what you've got to face up to, oh, that sounds awful, face up to, but the... You have to pull back. You simply have to pull back. But at the same time, you just have to realize you give them your best so you feel good about what you've given them, but you can't expect a response back. And I was in that situation, not a teaching situation, but I was in that situation where I simply had to detach my emotion, think the situation through in a logical way, and set my boundaries. Um, my mother was mentally ill for most of her life. She did not get institutionalized. And as she aged, she required a tremendous amount of, not so much physical, well, she did require some physical care, but she required a lot of attention from my sister and I towards the end of her life. And she was horrible to deal with. And I reached a point, and there's so much emotion involved with a parent, just like in trying to help students. And I reached a point where I realized, if I want to keep my sanity, I cannot, I have to step back, 
stop this, do not allow myself to also become crazy. And I have to just think through, what can I do? What can't I do? This is it. And then make those rules, make those boundaries. And because I, you know, there, there will come a time when you look at a situation and you have to say, I cannot fix this. No matter how much I want to, no matter how much I have invested in it, I cannot change it. And then once you've made that decision, you simply look at it and you say, okay, is there anything I can do, you know, to make it better? And what can I do with it without destroying myself? Because a lot of people, when they're trying to help someone else, forget that they're a factor themselves. And I think you've got it, pretty much. You know, I, it sounded like you had, like you'd pretty much reached that point. And um, you have to take care of yourself. You really do. Ah. Oh. God, I'm just rambling. But, you know, what you said affected me so much because it really was very much, when in, in your poem, the very same thought process that I went through in learning how to deal with my mother. A situation that would never be good, that I was intimately involved with, and I had to figure out how to deal with it. So I made a decision, you know, what can be done, and I gave as much as I decided I could, logically could, and I had to accept that there would never be positive feedback. And I think that's probably the hardest thing about the teacher situation and about my situation with my mother. You know, so often when you do what you consider a good thing, you get positive feedback. If you're in line with your gigantic grocery cart full of stuff, and somebody with just a little hand basket stands behind you looking forlorn, and you say, oh, go ahead, it's going to take me hours to get through here anyway you immediately get a smile. It's like, you did a good thing, they like it. You know, with my mother, I could probably have literally skinned myself alive and given her my skin, and she would not have liked it or appreciated it. And no matter what, and you know, teaching, I can tell when you showed your journal of, you know, the magazine pictures that you show your students, you really do care. And I think you reach more of them than you realize. But you have to just simply accept that many of them will never show their appreciation. They may not even be able to feel appreciation right now. And just do what I did with my mother. It sounds like you're doing it, but I just want to let you know I'm, I'm right there with you. You have to ex assess what you can safely do without hurting yourself. And that in many, many cases you are giving and you will not see the results of what you give and then just accept it. And that's how I finally learned to deal with my mother. I thought, how much can I give without going crazy? And I will never see the thanks. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I do want to read you something from my spiritual journal, this beautiful journal that Andy gave me. Um, I am assuming you're not going to be offended because you go to church. And if anyone else might be offended, this is kind of the end of my vlog. I'm just doing a quick reading, and um, so if you would prefer not to hear it, now is the time to tune out. Um, I put little butterflies on my page just to let you know. This is from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Um, in Protestant Bibles, Ecclesiasticus is not included. It is included in the Catholic Bible and in all the Orthodox, as in Greek Orthodox and Slavonic Orthodox Bibles. And I have it in mine. Mine is called the HarperCollins Study Bible with, with Apocrypha and deuter, Deuterocanonical books included. And so it has the traditional Old Testament that's in all the Bibles, the New Testament, and then it has these books um, called the Apocrypha that are only in, uh, that are in some Bibles and not others, kind of stuck in the middle. And so that is where these verses are coming from. This is Ecclesiasticus 30, 21 through 23. And it says, Do not give yourself over to sorrow, and do not distress yourself deliberately. A joyful heart is life itself, and rejoicing lengthens, one, lengthens one's lifespan. Indulge yourself and take comfort, and remove sorrow far from you. For sorrow has destroyed many, and no advantage ever comes from it.
And that is very meaningful to me, which is why it's in my spiritual journal. And I hope it helps you. And I really did not want to make a long rambling vlog at you. I really did not. Um, but anyway, um, I loved your poem about Get Over the Serious. I need that. Definitely need that. I hope you are having a blast working on that doll that I saw you buy all the cool fabric bits for. Have a wonderful night. And um, I really hope you don't mind the nosy old lady poking in with advice. Anyway, take care. Bye.